Welcome to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Bromel Benati alongside Ethan Euchre and world renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Benati. Exciting show lined up. Let's get right to it. After a Texas CEO and venture capitalist lost his sister to leukemia, he vowed to find a way to screen for cancer early and help save lives. Joining us to discuss is Sumit Rai, founder of Cancer Check Labs, which actually uses the most advanced and non-leading technologies to detect circulating tumor cells in the blood. Welcome to the show, Sumit. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Certainly. So why don't you tell us about your sister, Sonia? Her cancer experience prompted you to start this company. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, about 14 years ago in 2010, my only sibling, my younger sister, was diagnosed with cancer. And unfortunately, a year and a half later, passed away. And so from that point on, it, it really became my obsession and I dedicated my life to finding a way to cure cancer, the first step of which is really early detection. And so to that end, I began by starting a nonprofit organization, uh, 501c3, that we've run for over a dozen years. We do financial assistance for families that cannot afford to pay for their cancer care. We are one of the largest registrars of bone marrow donors in the world. Uh, we registered over 10,000 people in 300 drives in 60 cities. Uh, all of that while obsessively researching cancer and, and literally reading every single paper I could possibly find. All that research led me to uh, an insight. And that insight was the, the key to curing cancer, in my opinion, lies in something known as a CTC. A CTC is a circulating tumor cell. If you have a solid tumor, lung cancer, breast cancer, colon, pancreatic, liver, bladder, brain, esophageal, gastric, stomach, all the organ tumors from which, unfortunately, 100 million people a year suffer annually across the globe, the primary tumor itself generally does not kill you. What kills you is the tumor sheds tumor cells that circulate through your bloodstream known as circulating tumor cells or CTCs, the acronym for short. And the CTCs spread the cancer in your body. From that, we developed a test and we, you know, we've been involved in this technology for 14 years now that can essentially detect and isolate CTCs in the blood. Why do you think then all the, the scanning that we have for cancer doesn't focus on that? Because it's at a microscopic level. Imaging cannot detect CTCs. So today, in order to actually detect a tumor on an image, you have to be able to see it, which means it has to be big enough for you to see it. And so that usually doesn't occur until the tumor has grown to some substantial size. You know, when a tumor is born, right, one gram of tumor mass alone, just to put that in perspective, if you had breast cancer and you had one gram of tumor mass, one gram of tumor mass is not palpable. You cannot really feel it. Uh, it's so small that often they will refuse to biopsy because they will either miss or they will not get enough tissue. And if you cannot biopsy, you cannot diagnose. So one gram, which is not palpable, which is really not biopsable, which is not diagnosable, can kick off up to 3.2 million CTCs a day into your bloodstream. That is well before you're going to be able to really image it and detect it. The other problem is people often don't even go for imaging until they're symptomatic. If we can detect the, uh, the cancer at cellular level, then yes. we, can, we can plant the solution. Yes. And at the same time, if you have a tumor and the tumor is going to just, the cell will die and will eliminate some of the DNA of that specific area, when you get the the DNA of that cell in the blood, you can not only know that the person has an initial stage of cancer, but you, know, you also know that that is also in a specific organ. So you can plan immediately an amputation of the kidney, and that, that solved the problem. I mean, what you are working is just uh, unbelievable, fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that very much. And you're, you're, you're correct. You know, today... When a circulating tumor cell, a CTC, is, is dislodged from a primary tumor, essentially one of three things is going to happen to it. You know, A, it's going to go through programmed cell death known as apoptosis. Two, the CTC can get consumed by your essentially white blood cells, which is your immune function, which is what's supposed to happen. Or three, 
it'll go through your capillaries <laughs> and the shear stresses, the physical forces will actually fracture the cell and break it into little bits and pieces. Now, a lot of people have tried to detect cancer using this CT DNA technique, which you were referencing. The problem with that, it, there's several problems with that. Number one, you need to have the entire DNA sequence. If you don't have the entire DNA sequence, you can have a positive sample come in, you can't match the entire sequence and you return a false negative result. That's issue number one. Issue number two, false positive. Because if you have a healthy sample that comes in and you try to amplify it with PCR, you can actually mutate the sample itself, which results in essentially a false positive. Our test, on the other hand, we believe is far superior. And the reason for that is we're not looking at little scripts and scraps of DNA out of the genome. We are actually looking at the entire cell. Because we can do the whole cell capture, we can stain it, we can analyze it, and we literally hand it to a licensed pathologist that can visually inspect the cell and render their result. I always believe that if we do an early diagnosis, it needs to be something like, like the, the, the way that you are working. It's not important, for example, now in the stage that you are to start to publish or start to dis uh, practically guide the medical population to do an early test every year to every one of their patients and everybody then get the result. With what you have right now, that's the way that we should do it because that early diagnosis will save millions of dollars on treatment and millions of yeah. lives. Pancreatic cancer is a great example. Uh, pancreatic cancer is a presumed death sentence. Pancreatic cancer is not a death sentence. Stage four pancreatic cancer is a death sentence. Stage one pancreatic cancer, which is rarely found unless they're doing a procedure, for example, in the liver and they notice something abnormal adjacent in the region. Um, you know, if they do catch it, stage one is broken into 1A and 1B. Survival rates at 1B, even for pancreatic, are 85%. At 1A are 92%. So to your point, I completely agree with you. It is all about early detection. And so, you know, tumor cells, like I was saying, one gram can kick out 3.2 million CTCs a day. One gram of tumor mass is still essentially stage zero. And many papers have shown that CTCs can be detected as early as stage zero. So the potential of this, the impact on humanity is profound. It is truly revolutionary because if you think about last year, I mean, there were 10 million recorded deaths in cancer. And obviously, there are more unrecorded deaths. Just on the recorded number of deaths with the population growth and the incidence of cancer, unfortunately, rising so rapidly in the younger population, even at the current rate, which could likely go up, which is why cancer is overtaking heart disease as the number one cause of mortality, 10 million people a year in one short century, just 100 years, you were talking about 1 billion lives. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Sumit Rai, for being on the program and being able to turn something that was such a loss into something beautiful that will end up saving countless lives. Thank you for being on our program. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. We'll be right back after the break. You're watching American Medicine Today. Don't be screwed by lesser spine institutes who bait you with minimally invasive procedures, then switch to screws, rods, disc replacements, and hardware. At Bonatti, no metal hardware fusions are ever used. Bonatti invented the precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti spine procedures, they consistently reflect 98.75% patient satisfaction. Over half our patients have suffered from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Meet Bonatti Spine Institute guest Timothy Yost, who came to the Institute suffering with cervical spine issues. Well, before I moved to Florida, I would do a lot of snowboarding, so I'd do the jumps in the parks and stuff like that. I also love being outdoors, hiking, fishing, hunting, everything that you can do outside. And then moving out here, you know, I wanted to get into wakeboarding and stuff like that, so uh, I just love outdoors, outdoors activities all the time. He likes to stay busy enjoying the great outdoors, but there's no doubt his active lifestyle resulted in some injuries after a few accidents in his younger years. When I fell out of the back of a moving truck and then, you know, snowboarding, I came off of a 20 foot drop and landed on my neck. Somewhat concussed, but you know, just rode it off. 
being young and dumb again. <laughs> and then I uh, was going down through the trails, hit a powder patch and cartwheeled off my face. So that right there was another jolt to the neck. As time went on, his condition worsened. Tim began experiencing more severe symptoms. Every day I had a headache, every day, all day, consistent, to the point that I was taking multiple amounts of ibuprofen, anti-inflammatories all day, and I never got relief from it. It was just consistent every day. Um, and then I was having chest pains, which felt like a heart attack. Um, I actually got prescribed nitroglycerin because the work I do, they thought that I could possibly have a heart attack even though my heart tested fine. So it was kind of one of those like scary moments where I was in pain all the time and I was having chest pains to the point that the doctor wasn't sure if I was gonna have a heart attack or not. My neck always hurt. Um, there was times where it was like I just, I would stay home and then everyone else would go out and do something because it just, the pain was just too bad. And I don't want to be, you know, the bringer down of the party, you know, everyone needs to do something. You need to get out and about and have fun. So, I mean, that's life. But when you're, when you're hurting, you just kind of either go with it and pretend it's not there or just deal with it as long as you can until you have to, you know, take something for it. And then I looked into a neurologist and the first thing he said was my neck was destroyed. I looked like a 58 year old person's neck and I needed to be fused. And I know that is like the worst trail to take. I got online, started doing my research. When Tim found the Bonatti Spine Institute online, one thing immediately stood out. Seeing that the first thing they said is do not fuse. And that was my eye opener right there. When I first reached out put to Bonatti, it was uh, within minutes. I had uh, a phone call con conversation back um, asking me uh, just simple questions, uh, see if I was a candidate for them and to see if I'd be willing to come in and have a consultation and sit down and kind of go over some of the information that I had that was uh, an issue for me. He made an appointment to consult with the Bonatti surgical staff on possible treatment options. I thought I was just going to come in and sit down and talk and I ended up coming in. I sat down, I was talking and I was doing little tests and I was getting checked out and then I was being sent over for x-rays and they were getting my MRI checked out. I went over it with my surgeon. He explained everything to me. He was showing me step by step on two different sections. You can see where the spinal cord was getting pinched down. Um, and he was explaining like how the nerves were being pinched off and where it was causing certain pains in my body. Um, like on the left side, it was actually causing chest pain, which was considered the phantom heart attacks. Well, this one will fix this one. So C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6. They even have a little chart here, which is cool because then it shows like pain running down on the right side or the pain running down on the left side, which section does what and where it affects your body the most, like the tingling in the fingers. They make sure you understand before you walk out of there so you're not confused into what exactly they're, ex they're explaining to you on what body parts are hurting and why and where it's hurting in your back to to fix the issue. I felt confident. When I walked out after he explained everything to me, I honestly felt comfortable. I just thought I could be healed. That was my first thought was, wow, the chest pain's gonna go away. I'm gonna not have headaches anymore. I felt very comfortable. Tim was scheduled for the targeted Bonatti spine procedures to eliminate his pain. I had three down the right side uh, to fix all the pain because I had most of my pain on my right um, and one on the left side to fix the pain in my chest. I've never had surgery before ever, like even on my teeth or anything. This is my first ever. So I thought maybe I'd be nervous, but when I got in, it was so comforting. It was like we were all friends hanging out, you know, and talking and chatting. They explain everything to you. And it's just, it's a comforting feeling. It's not like you're, you're not being rushed. They, they want to know you. They talk about life, not just procedure of what's going on and they're not in and out of the room and leave you there. I actually felt really comfortable. I wasn't even nervous getting on the table uh, in the surgery room either. Conscious IV sedation is used during the exclusive Bonatti spine procedures to ensure the source of the patient's pain is eliminated before they leave the operating table. I did make me a little nervous at first, but then as it was going along, it wasn't, it wasn't what I thought it was. It was actually a lot easier and I kind of liked being coherent enough to where I can talk to them. And I wasn't just completely out of it. And then, hey, wake up. You know, I, I like the being awake part. And then they were asking if you can, like certain spots when they were fixing your neck, they would ask, oh, are you feeling that in your shoulder? Are you feeling that in your chest? Uh, where, where are you feeling the, you know, the relief or the pain? Or it was nice because they were explaining things as they were doing it. But at the same time, they were asking for your feedback to make sure that, you know, 
they were doing the right thing for you. Once the personalized procedure is complete, guests are relocated to the recovery room, where just minutes after surgery, they are asked to get up and walk. They always have a good positive attitude back there. The first thing they do is assist you, ask you if you need anything to drink, you need anything to eat, because, um, I mean, it's you're not put out. So this way you're awake and you're coherent, so you're still functioning, you know? And uh, I mean, you, you get in there and you're not in much pain at all, to be honest. They like to make sure that everything's working fine. They check your vitals. They make you feel comfortable. I mean, it makes you feel like family back there. I mean, you're not, you're not a number, you're a human being. Often, but not a guest are surprised by how quickly they are out of the debilitating pain that brought them to the Institute. The first surgery they did, Immediately, it took the pressure out of the back of my head, which was causing all my headaches. Uh, the next day, I woke up without a headache at all, and I was just amazed. I was, I was amazed. I didn't know what to do, because I looked at my wife and I was like, I don't have a headache. I've never felt like this in forever. <laughs> so it was, I knew I was on the right path. Tim explains how he feels the morning following his final procedure. I'm actually feeling good. I, I feel normal. I mean, a little sore, but I mean, who isn't sore? It's like working out at the gym or something and stretching a muscle. Uh, so other than that, I feel I feel normal. I feel great. I mean, you would think with surgery, you'd be in excruciating pain and be laid out. I've been up moving around since yesterday. Uh, I've been out walking around. I've been uh, walking with my dog and stuff. I, I, I was walking back and forth through the recovery room, no problem. I mean, I can move my neck left and right, up and down. I mean, it's a little sore, but it's not what you would think for a surgery at all. It's amazing. For Tim, his Bonatti Spine Institute experience was enhanced by the feeling of validation. I was not a number when I came in. I was a name. They knew me. They they greeted me every time I came in. It was like the first time I came to the door, I gave them my name. And after that, every time I've walked in, they've always greeted me with by my name and knew who I was and what was going on. I think this is the best decision I've made. It's, it's worth it. It's worth it. It makes a world of difference. To see more stories of recovery just like this, search the Bonatti Spine Institute on YouTube, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Google Play Store, and Apple's App Store. Welcome back to American Medicine Today. I'm alongside Dr. Craig Wolf from the Bonatti Spine Institute. Dr. Wolf, why don't you tell us about some of the people you're treating at the Bonatti Institute? The general person that comes to the Bonatti Institute suffers most likely from low back pain. By far, statistically, that's the most common person. Mm -hmm. And then after that would be neck problems or neck pain. Mm -hmm. And finally, much less, but they do come in, are people with mid-back pain, or otherwise we refer to it as thoracic pain. In the low back, the people that come to us tend to have, th uh, let's say, two types of conditions. Mm -hmm. The younger people will tend to have a herniated disc, mm -hmm. and elderly people um, will tend to have a condition called spinal stenosis. Yes. Now, in between those two would be the are my age people. Um, so let's say between 40 and 60, they sure. often have a combination of both things happening mm -hmm. at the same time. Right. So not only do they have what their doctor will tell them is bulging disc or herniated disc, but also on top of that, spinal stenosis is superimposed. And spinal stenosis is just meaning narrowing of the tube of nerves in the low back, for instance, what we're talking about right now, the low back. Is that almost like... Um now, forgive me, I'm going to say something. I'm not a doctor, but almost like an arthritis of the spinal canal because it keeps narrowing. It's exactly what it is. Okay. So, so if we could, um, because so many people suffer from spinal stenosis, I think it's important to just mention a few words of what causes it. Mm -hmm. So as we get older, as a normal process of aging, we lose water content in our disc. And our discs are 90% water. And that's what keeps them tall and somewhat mm -hmm. firm like a tire on your car that's full of air. Sure. As we get older, the natural degeneration of the disc causes the disc to start losing its water content, and then it starts to shrink or collapse inside. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the discs are the front part of the spine in front of the nerves, and in back of the nerves, we have joints. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned arthritis. The, yes. the degeneration of a joint is called arthritis. They're different kinds, but in the case we're talking of degenerative arthritis or osteoarthritis. 
So as the disc collapses, the joints are intimately linked to the disc. The joints, in a sense, collapse, and they don't line up. So imagine if I gave you a bow leg. Mm. You would wear out the inside of your knee more than the outside of your knee because you'll be putting more weight through the inside. Sure. Well, when the joints of your back start collapsing, they don't line up, and they form arthritis. Mm -hmm. Now, in osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis, telltale things that occur with the arthritis are, number one, you lose the cartilage in a joint. And that's when the doctor might tell one of our patients, you have bone on bone. Right. There's supposed to be a space between the bones, cartilage, which is that white stuff you see on the ends of chicken bones. Right. <laughs> it's nice and smooth, mm -hmm. and it separates bones that have to move on each other. Then the, the bones start rubbing on each other because there's no cartilage, and the body's response to that is to form bone. Maybe the body's trying to fuse these joints. Right. So the joints grow in size, mm -hmm. and then they form bone spurs. As the joint grows and forms bone spurs, those tend to head from the back to the front and in front of the joints are the nerves. So bone is strong and mean and it will just push into the nerves which are soft and gentle mm -hmm. and the bone wins every time. Once it narrows the, the space for the nerves mm -hmm. a certain degree, you'll get pain. Okay. And that pain will often start in the back because the joints are bad and they're in your back. Mm -hmm. But as it hits the nerve or narrows the space for the nerve, it'll start, and re we're referring to the low back, it'll start going down your leg, either the front, the side, or the back right. of the leg. With that pain, you may experience numbness and tingling. That's also an indication that a nerve is being uh, um, angered. Okay. And these are the first things that happen. Probably pain first, numbness and tingling second. Mm -hmm. As the condition continues to get worse, meaning the space for the nerve gets smaller and smaller, and it's been there longer and longer, you will get weakness. Now, why? Nerves are, what our nerves do in our body, one of the main things they do is they tell our muscles what to do. And if the nerve is pinched and doesn't send the electrical signals correctly to your muscle, the muscle will shrink in size. Just like if you hurt yourself and we put a cast on your arm. Right. Once we take that cast off in six weeks, your arm is half the size of the other arm. You say, yes. what, what happened to my arm? Mm -hmm. That's the muscle mass that you lose. So the weakness comes from a loss of muscle mass, probably number one. But number two, with the nerve sending, let's say, bad signals because mm -hmm. it's pinched, and it, the electrical signal is now not good, the muscle does not act in a coordinated fashion. Mm -hmm. So people will often say that they don't feel like they're walking right. Or what do they often tell us? I, I think my balance is off. But mm -hmm. it's not their balance coming from their inner ear or their brain. It's because they're not getting a, a good electrical signal to the muscles. Is that when people have trouble sometimes with a drop foot or they can't manage the stairs? Because they feel like they're going to fall? Foot drop is when you can't raise your foot. So imagine um, when I say raise, the opposite of pushing down on the brake or the accelerator. Mm. When you have to pull your foot back up um, and you can't, that's what we call foot drop. The act of walking requires us subconsciously to every time we take a step, we have to pull our foot up. Otherwise, the toes catch the ground and we could potentially fall and hurt ourselves, especially as we get older and our bones are not as strong. And that then becomes a danger for people getting wrist fractures or hip fractures. So that generally occurs, the foot drop is the L5 nerve, and it usually occurs from a narrowing, or as we use the, science, the medical term stenosis, at the L4-5 level. And the vast majority of patients that come to the Bonatti Institute, it's because of L4-5, number one, and probably number two is L3-4. And then beyond that, the other key level in the low back is L5-S1, which is more of a problem for young people. And that would be the sciatica, like, oh, there's some butt pain, and then it travels down the back of the thigh. I, yeah, I think you're right. I think mo lay people think of sciatica as a pain that goes into your rear end and goes down the back of mm -hmm. your leg. And the reason is because it's called sciatica because the nerve roots come out of your back and they join up together in a big nerve in your rear end called the sciatic nerve, which then generally goes down the back of your leg and then splits in some wrap around towards the front right. as we get below the knee. Mm -hmm. And that's what sciatica um, is. But anyone, I, I if somebody calls me and says, I have pain down mm -hmm. the side of my leg, I have no problem referring to that as sciatica. 
We'll be back after a quick break. We're talking with Dr. Craig Wolf of the Bonatti Spine Institute. I think everybody was shocked. Like, really, you had surgery today? I had a drain tube. I was at my desk doing payroll for 200 employees. Worked till night, got up, went to bed. Actually, the recovery was great. I mean, I really immediately felt the difference. I was able to go back to work within a couple of days. The progress after each procedure was amazingly good. The recovery, all told, has been phenomenal. The surgeries that I had, actually, I recovered very easily from, I would say. Um, I actually went to work the following afternoon. Six days after surgery, I was back in the gym, slowly but surely working my way back to back to fighting, back to, back to basically 100% of fighting, you know? So six days and everybody was in awe, like, didn't you just get out of surgery? I'm like, yeah, I feel great. First time I came in here was Monday and today is Thursday. I've had two surgeries and am doing fantastic. I'm still in shock that I can walk. That's all within four days. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Welcome back to American Medicine Today. We're in the middle of our discussion with Dr. Craig Wolf talking about the types of people that seek out treatment from the Bonatti Spine Institute. Dr. Wolf, if people let things like stenosis get out of hand and, and the spinal canal keeps narrowing and narrowing, eventually they'll end up in a wheelchair, correct? Um, if it's yeah, depending not treated, on their age, right? right. Because this, these are slow processes. As I said, mm -hmm. they start in the disc and let's say they. it depends on what you do. And yes. your genetics. So I, maybe genetics is the most important thing and what you do. So in Indiana, they work in, they build um, recreational vehicles. They're mm -hmm. skilled craftsmen. Yes. And that's hard, heavy lifting work. Mm -hmm. So they may wear out their discs in their late teens and early 20s. Mm -hmm. And then the stenosis starts. If stenosis starts in your 30s or 40s, what you said, you'll end up in a wheelchair is probably tr true, as opposed to if it starts in your 70s, because it probably takes 10 years or more for that to happen. Stenosis does not get better on its own. Correct. Bone does not disappear. Yes. It only continues to grow. Mm. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to explain the types of people that seek out the Bonatti Spine Institute and how the ailments affect those individuals. Thank you for watching American Medicine Today and check us out anytime, anywhere on our app. Search keyword AMT. If you have any comments or questions, contact us at the numbers below, or you can tweet at Dr. Bonatti using the hashtag American Medicine Today or hashtag AMT. We would like to hear from you.